Before I begin, I, I, brought, I, I just want to show you what I'm going to be talking about. You won't be able to see it. That's okay. <laughs> this is like the real thing. That's not real. I mean, not the same. Everything stated or expressed by man is a note in the margin of a completely erased text. Fernando Pessoa. I was on a plane, and as often happens, the woman next to me asked me what I did. And it often happens in such circumstances as we are no longer actually on earth, but suspended in the ether above, that a lie takes place. But as I was in no mood for a lie to take place, I said, I do biblical erasures. <laughs> and she said, Bible erasers, you must sell a great many of them. <laughs> I didn't know if she meant pink rubber erasers with biblical quotes stamped on them was a commodity appealing to millions or, since I claim to support myself in this manner, I would certainly have to sell millions of them. But as I was still in the truth-telling mode, I said, actually, I haven't sold a single one. And as the air of the airplane was suddenly warm and oppressive, I struggled to remove my overcoat when she reached out to help me, and I was overcome by this unexpected and tender gesture of assistance. And to my great embarrassment, and for reasons having nothing to do with our conversation, I began to cry. And she said, don't worry, dear. God works in mysterious ways. And we never spoke again. But a month afterwards, I dedicated my new book of poems to her, a perfect stranger whose name I don't even know because she had become by then, in my mind, the perfect stranger, and I have, since then, sold a great many of them. An erasure is the creation of a new text by disappearing the old text that surrounds it. I don't consider the pages to be poems, but I do think of them as poetry. When I finish an erasure book, I, have, I feel I have written a book of poetry without a single poem in it, and that appeals to me. The books have been called found poems, but I don't consider them as such. A found poem is a text found in the world, taken out of its worldly context, and labeled a poem. I certainly didn't find any of these pages. I made them, just as I do my other work. In the erasures, I can only choose words out of all the words on a given page. While writing regularly, I can choose from all the words in existence. In that sense, the erasures are like a form. I am restricted by certain rules. I have resisted formal poetry my whole life, but at last found a form I can't resist. It is like writing with my eyes instead of my hands. I use white out, buff out, blue out, paper, ink, pencil, gouache, carbon, and marker. Sometimes I press postage stamps onto the page and pull them off. That literally takes the text right off the page. Once, while working on an all white erasure, I had the sense I was somehow blinding the words, blindfolding the ones I whited out, and those that were left had to become, I don't know, extra sensory or something. And then I thought, no, I am bandaging the words, and the ones left are those that seep out. Am I burying or unearthing? To bury something, you must unearth. You must heap the soil somewhere. Think of any gardener digging a hole, and next to them a heap of earth bearing some other spot. One cannot engage in either activity without enacting the opposite activity. And if I am an archaeologist among words, it is with a twist. 
I must find new societies under old ones, perhaps even ones that don't yet exist. I have made 72 erasure books. I have given many to friends as gifts. One has been published and the bulk sold long after that conversation on the plane into private and public collections. One or two of the books work when read aloud in public, but most of them don't. I can't ever imagine stop, stopping making them, and I hope to be working on one when I die. You know how you go into the wilderness? When you go into the wilderness, you are expected to bring out your trash, leaving nothing behind? I spent the first half of my life leaving words in the world, and will spend the last half taking them out. After all, when they asked Neil Armstrong how he felt about his footsteps being left on the moon, he said he'd like to go back up and erase them. I call them erasures, but elsewhere they have been referred to as elision books, hyper-editing, cross-out, and my least favorite of all these unfavorites, creative defacement. They are texts made by getting rid of, in a thousand and one ways, surrounding pre-existing text. Governments call it censorship. I do not know their origin, but any reasonably intelligent person can imagine a worker in a censorship office censoring letters mailed from the front line who, to relieve the tedium of his job, merely thought to himself, if I wanted to, I could make this letter say some strange things in such a way that it would actually be more interesting than what is being said now. Or a government official deleting highly sensitive material in a document in preparation for releasing the document to another party or to the public. And the difference between these two imaginary scenarios is that one end is aesthetic and the other is political. And in 2014, these two ends are still the only ends of this act, though postmodernism has obviously conflated both ends in the erasure work of a great many visual artists, such as Jenny Holzer. To take only one example, an exhibition of whose I recently saw in a museum and which was comprised of a great many blown up and censored documents of the United States government. And though Ms. Holzer has produced work in the past I am inordinately fond of, it had been a long time since I had seen such a thoroughly boring exhibition. The one I want to talk to about is Tom Phillips, because the aesthetic ends of erasure, everyone agrees, begin with Tom Phillips, and the artifact that was slowly and surprisingly to become his life's work. An artifact I am loath to talk about because it must be seen to be believed by being experienced, but I will do the best I can to speak briefly of this work of art. One, I came to myself in the 1980s when reading an issue of Art Forum in which prominent artists were asked to name what they considered privately and personally the greatest work of art of the 20th century, and the writer William Goss, Gass named Humament by Tom Phillips. This is Tom Phillips, Humament. In the, the mid-1960s, Tom Phillips was inspired by William Burroughs' cut-up texts, the ones the American writer made by cutting up newspaper texts and rearranging it. Phillips used British newspapers to the same end, but was soon determined to take the whole thing, the whole thing further. He set a rule for himself. He would buy the first book he came across that cost three pence. He found for three pence an old used copy of a Victorian novel he had never heard of called A Human Document by William Hurl Mallock, printed in 1872. A novel Phillips discovered had been so popular in its day that the edition he purchased was in its 7,000th printing. And so, he began the, and so began the collaboration of Mr. Phillips and Mr. Mallock, the original author. Beginning to erase text using ordinary pen and ink, Phillips soon switched to gouache and watercolor and began to paint each page of the 367-page novel, at the same time leaving selected exposed text so that the treated novel became an illuminated manuscript, often compared to the work of William Blake and now owned by the Tate Gallery in London. 
The book was first published in book form, such a funny thing to say, in 1980, and it is a novel within a novel, so to speak, a narrative made out of another narrative, though many of the pages stand alone as poetic or philosophical text. There's a character, Bill Toge, T-O-G-E, whose name Phillips could only use on those pages where either the word together or altogether were used, the requisite T-O-G-E being found in either of these words. To quote Phillips speaking of this feast of a book, it is the solution for this artist of the problem of wishing to write poetry while not in the real sense of the word being a poet. He gets there by standing on someone else's shoulder. This quote remains in the present tense because Philip has never stopped working on the novel, though finishing his first treatment of it long ago. He continues to treat the novel page after page, never repeating his previous treatments, not to mention a complete opera score he made out of the novel. To this end, of course, he needed more copies of the book, and by 1997 had 15 copies. He has, he has done 20 variations alone of page 85. The second copy of a human document that he bought had been bought in 1902 by a woman who had underlined whole passages and added marginalia, an act he loved and wholly welcomed because he realized that over time, when we underline a passage in a book or add marginalia, we ourselves are treating the book we're reading. As Mandelstam once said, Erase everything you have written, but keep the notes in the margin. Philip soon realized that he was engaged in a great act of deconstruction, to use the byword of those days. And beyond all of this, and much more which I am not even bothering to mention, he realized that he was engaged in a paradoxical enactment of Mallarmé's famous dictum that everything in the world exists in order to end up in a book. Even books exist to end up as books. He also discovered the original Victorian novel, A Human Document, is mentioned in a novel by Dorothy Richardson, which is where my life comes in, perhaps, maybe, for no one can ever really tell when a thing or where a thing begins. Dorothy Richardson, who lived from 1873 to 1957, was a novelist who was an intimate friend of H.G. Wells and other avant-garde thinkers of the day, all of whom encouraged her to write. She wrote a series of autobiographical novels and became a pioneer of the stream of consciousness technique, and Virginia Woolf credited her with inventing the psychological sentence of the feminine gender. But she was almost completely ignored and forgotten till the feminist heyday of the 1960s and 70s when she was champion and rose from obscurity to become the feminist avant-garde darling that she, well, always was. In the early 1980s, in the early 1980s, I was teach when I was teaching at Bennington College, I had a remarkable student named Lisa Conrad, who is now a visual artist and librarian living in San Francisco. At some point, I no longer remember when, she sent me the photograph of an installation she had erected on the outskirts of San Francisco, a corrugated iron billboard with lettering punched out on it from a text by Dorothy Richardson. I liked it so much and was so moved by the text that I put it in a little plastic frame and hung it on my wall. And though I have moved many, many times since then, it remains this day on my wall. This is its text. If still astounding, being alive, enough would lie. Everything one did, instruction, astonishment. It was a typo, it's would die. <clears throat> if still astounding, being alive, enough would die. Everything one did, instruction, astonishment. I did not realize until preparing to talk to you today that the text is an erasure. Years before I myself began doing erasures, I stared at one every day. You see, discovering Tom Phillips did not lead me to erasures, nor did Lisa's billboard, or did it, nor did the Vermont College graduating lecture by my 
other remarkable student, Natasha DeShomer, a photographer who showed us on a screen erased pages, which I remember as predominantly in a single color, such as bright scarlet, with only a single word or at most two left visible, home, say, or nest. Natasha's work took my breath away. I remember silently weeping in the back of the room, but she was much, much more of a minimalist than I could ever bear to be. No, I think I only sensed then that this thing, this using pages of one book to make another book, had more possibilities than I had ever dreamt of. And that even though I was not a visual artist like Tom Phillips, I was a poet, someone who was predominantly a poet, and could approach the pages of an old book and find there the possibility of poetic texts that traveled outside the margins of conventional poetry. And this was a place I very much wanted to inhabit for the single reason it felt like home. I am not and never will be the great visual artist that Tom Phillips is. But I can, and this is possibly the boldest statement I have ever made, find in five minutes poetic text that it takes Tom Phillips six months to find. My text finding limit is 10 minutes. Mr. Phillips is one year. You see, I don't actually read the books. I don't read the text, unless the book is very, very, very interesting to me, and that has only happened twice in 15 years. The only way I can describe it is like this. The words rise above the page by, say, an eighth of an inch, and they hover there in space, singly and unconnected, and they form a kind of field, and from this field, I pick my words as if they were flowers. And so, one day in 1998, for three dollars, I bought a soft, small leather 19th century book, and using an ordinary black pen, began crossing out words. It's crude, to be sure. I don't care. My first 15 books are very crude indeed. I learned as I went along, and I am learning still. I took off on my own private path, and I have never looked back. At some point, I discovered I had a secret bond with Whiteout. Perhaps I have lived through too many blizzards. At some point, I discovered you can't use graphite unless you use a fixative. I discovered gouache because Joshua Beckman mentioned he was using it. At some point, I began to cut out pictures from other books and paste them into the pages of my books to collage text and image. At some point, I heard other writers were doing the same thing. I heard Jen Bourbon had done Shakespeare's sonnets, nets, and Ronald Johnson, Paradise Lost, radios. But I liked my obscure little books. I had no interest in famous works. I discovered Thomas Jefferson had done it, and that Susan Howe, Matea Harvey, Shri Shrikanth Reddy, and Jonathan Safran Fro, among others, were doing it. I became friends with the visual artist Will Ashford, who had been doing for years exactly what Tom Phillips was doing without ever having heard of Phillips. Imagine the ultimate artist's crisis to labor for years over what you believe to be a unique form and then find out someone else is famous for the same thing. Mr. Ashford did stop working for a while in his shock and then got on with his work, picking up where he had left off. Why stop your own joy from unfolding? At some point I became involved In some point, I became involved in an erasure correspondence with my editor, Joshua Beckman. We erased, over six years, the entire Flaubert George Sand correspondence. We did it by mail, the same form in which they had corresponded. He was Flaubert, I was Sand. Four-page letters were reduced to two lines. Light along the river, and I walked, pretending I was a tide, in thin exaggeration, alone. I love being particular. One existence, what a task. A little note from your north wind, adieu. Without knowing that Phillips redid his own pages, with no knowledge of that at all, I found a second copy of a book I had previously erased and jumped at the chance to do it all over again, to see if I would erase a single page in the same way. No, I didn't, I couldn't. It was, as Phillips said, a feast. 
But it doesn't interest everyone. Most people I have found are either horrified or bored by it. Visual artists will turn the pages of an erasure book and not read the text. They will only look for visuals. Nothing else interests them. I find it amusing. Poets I thought would be interested tell me to my face they don't like it. I love it when that happens. I love loving something so much you simply don't care what other people think. And most of all, and most of all, I am chagrined by those who think that it's fun and easy and run out and buy a book and then run to me and show me what they've done, seeking my approval. This has happened more than once. Or by those who endlessly find little books and send them to me in the hopes I will erase them. I like to choose my own books. You see, I am not encouraging you to do this because it is exactly like art. It is a private journey. We can be inspired and we can be influenced, but the predominant note of any journey must be found in the quiet unfolding of our own time on Earth. That said, I will say this. Eight times out of ten, an erasure of a poem made by the author of that poem will be better than the original poem. It is sometimes called revision, but of course, you cannot actually you cannot actually read the original poem. You can only look at the words. It's hard, you can't really read the text when it's blown up. Um, years patch up an old one of somebody else's and that does it. Something like that. I will now add, you can go through all to the end. I will now add, as an addendum to these remarks, the information, quite logical, that erasure is not exclusive to written text. Bill Morrison's film, Decasia, is a film erasure made entirely by editing decayed film stock, old film from a variety of sources that had decayed throughout time to the point of being burnt out or erased and as such is a complete and unique erasure experience. But be forewarned, the film will either change your life or you will not be able to endure it to its end. It is a litmus test of how you react to erasure. And the same might be said of William Belinsky's The Disintegration Loops, music created when Belinsky attempted to transfer old tape loops from analog to reel to reel tape, from analog reel to reel tape to digital hard disk but the tapes were old and they were disintegrating. The music was dying, says Belinsky in his liner notes, but he kept recording and documenting the death of the loops. And as it happened, he was doing this on the morning of 9-11, and there you can see on your uh, YouTube, uh, you can listen to the music uh, while what's happening across the river is being filmed. It's absolutely extraordinary. So sometimes we just stumble upon an act of erasure and recognize its beauty and seek to preserve it, seek to preserve that which has not yet been preserved. We make compositions out of decompositions. And who can forget the famous Erase de Kooning by Robert Rauschenberg when the savvy young artist, again working in the heyday of deconstruction, was given a drawing by William de Kooning and took an eraser and erased most of it and promptly sold it for boodles as a Rauschenberg cum de Kooning. And who can forget? And who can forget? I can, you may be thinking, because I never knew any of this before, or I can because none of this is of interest to me or changes my life. So I, I, I can forget. And that, my friend, is the art of, is the art of erasure as it is enacted in your own life and all lives. Life is much, much more than is necessary and much, much more than any of us can bear. So we erase it or it erases us. We ourselves are an erasure of everything we have forgotten or don't know or haven't experienced. 
and on our deathbed, even that limited and erased whole becomes further diminished. And if you are lucky, really lucky, you will remember the one word, water, all others having been erased. And if you are really lucky, you will remember one place or one person, but no one will ever, ever read on their deathbed the whole text intact and in order. First your life is erased, and then you are erased. And don't tell me that erasure is beside the point, an artsy fragment of the healthy whole. If it is an appropriation, it is an appropriation of every single life that has preceded your own, just as those in the future will appropriate yours when you are gone. And they will appropriate your very needs, your very desires, your gestures, your questions, and your words. Or so I believe. And I am glad. What is the, etern what is the alternative? A blank page. I am all the book remembers of itself. I will now read an erasure of this talk. I call them erasures, and so began, because lips never stopped working, for one can never tell an intimate rose from the remarkable habit of crude time. Thank you.